Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are you all doing? Happy? So great to see you this morning for our special back to school worship and brunch. Should we just skip the worship and go straight to brunch? What do you reckon? I smelt the bacon and the sausages and the pancakes and the fruit and the cheese. I didn't smell the cheese. No, I did smell the cheese. It's all over there. So the way it works this morning is we've got half an hour. Can you turn me up a tiny bit so I don't have to shout? That'd be great. Um, the way it works this morning is we're going to have half an hour together, worshipping together, and then our children and young people's groups will go uh, take place in the hall and our leaders will take the children and young people over to the hall. And the rest of us will stay in here for about half an hour of teaching and prayer. And that's the way it works. So welcome if it's your first time at St. Mark's. It's great to have you with us. Now, let's get ready. We start by preparing our hearts and minds to meet with God. So everything you'll need will be on the screen. And let's pray this preparation prayer together. Almighty God, you know everything we need and want. And nothing is hidden from you. We are here to worship you, to pray for the needs of the world, and to listen to your word. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and open our hearts to your love. Amen. Right, we're going to need some help with this song. So children, come out to the front. Helen, come out to the front. I need some help. I can't do this on my own. I need some help. Helen, come out to the front. Brilliant. Come out here, everybody. Come out here. Well, I can, I can treat Helen, you know the actions, don't you? So you can, I can treat Helen. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, I know the actions. So this is the song that we've written in-house. This is a St. Mark song. And it's called Rooted in My God. Now, it's a, it's a bit hillbilly, so we need lots of yee-haws, yee-haws, whoops. You're allowed to do anything like this. Now, let's just have a little practice. Can you actually everybody stand up for a moment? Everybody stand up for a moment. Okay, now I don't know how, I, I, I don't know how, is, how is your hillbilly dancing? Is it good? Is it good? Yeah. Mark's like, yeah, not too bad, not too bad. So I want you to go, let's just round our shoulders like this. Can you do that? Round our shoulders. All right? And now I want your shoulders to go up and down. Can you do that? Like that? Oh, brilliant. Well done. <laughs> now, can you do that and go up and down like this at the same time? Can you do that? Right yeah. Can you bend your legs? Shoulders up, bend your legs at the same time. You do that. And if you're a Shireen, you can even do the actions like that. Yeah. Okay. So you can do that. That's, that's, a, that's a good move. Yeah. And if you're feeling really, really brave, you can even do that. Like that. Okay. But for the rest of us, there are actions, and it's really. Sick. Do you know, should we just go? Should we go through just the first one, or should we? Go, yeah. Okay. Go through the first one. So, it's very simple. The words are on the screen. Lord, I plant myself in you. So we're going to dive down. Plant myself in you. As I grow and spread my branches, live a life that's full of blossom. Like a big blossom, little hands, like the blossomy hands. With fruit to give away. That's one hand and then the other. Fruit to give away. I'm holding this. It's a bit difficult. Bright leaves shining in your light. Okay, leaves. Put your... No, that's blossom. Okay. <laughs> Leave. Put your hands together like that. Blossom. Yeah, light. Bright. <laughs> bright leaves shining in your light. As I flower in your sunshine, you can go left to right or right to left, I don't mind. Like a tree. Now, sign language for tree. Helen's doing the sign language tree. I can't do it in the whole back of Like a tree. That's sign language for tree. Yeah? By the waters, I am rooted in my God. Like that. Very good. Okay, well, let's do the second verse because it's going to go fast. <laughs> so, teach, teach me your ways, O oh Lord. You feed me day and night, and then put them back on your, on your chest again. Uh, look, there they go, there. Hear me when I pray to you. That's praying hands. And teach me wrong from right. I am filled, uh, filled up with Lord Jesus in my heart. I am in the hands of the chin. I am filled with joy and laughter. Like a tree by the waters, I am rooted in my God. And the last, the last verse... When I'm shaken by the storms, if you stagger around a bit, when the cold winds, that's the cold winds whip my branches, and the hail and thunder crashes, cover your ears, and my bowels begin to sway. Lord, my strength is found in you. 
And no storms of life will break me like a tree by the waters I am rooted in. Are we ready? We got it? Woo! Here we go. We can do this. You may be seated. <laughs> now, actually, yeah, children, you can go back to your seats just for a moment. Well done. Did really, really well. Who can tell that the vicar and his wife worked out the actions <laughs> about 10 minutes ago to that song? <laughs> That's why we hadn't quite learned them. But brilliant. Thank you very, very much for all your help with the song and the actions. You are brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Well, when we come before God, we have a little moment of quiet, just a bit of quiet, when we think about our own lives and we recognize that we're coming before this almighty God of all creation, this awesome, wondrous God. We remember that we may do things wrong, don't we? We think things, we say things, we do things that we know hurt God and hurt those we love. We forget and fail to live the way we should and disrespect God's world, don't we? So let us spend a moment in quiet to recognise our own mistakes and failures before we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, as you come before this almighty, awesome, wondrous God, know that you are forgiven. Know that Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, didn't just cover you for all your past sins, didn't just cover you for all your present sins, but covers you for every single thing you will ever do wrong in the future, once and for all. Know that you are forgiven, loved, and more precious than you can possibly imagine. Amen. So let's rejoice. We're going to sing this awesome song, Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. We all know the actions to this one. Well, all those that have been here <laughs> over the last year all know these actions. Stand, let's stand and let's sing this together.
you are amazing. Absolutely amazing. I love that. It's great, isn't it, to rejoice? It might be a little bit warm in here. I don't know about you, but I am woo, lobstering up the front of here. But it's still great, isn't it, to worship our God. Somebody said to me, oh, we can't. We have to be serious in church and really sensible and serious. No. We have a God who is full of joy and laughter and fun. And I think going to church or being, going to worship should be fun too. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Would you like to offer one another a sign of peace? Peace with you. We have a beautiful hot loaf of bread that's come out of the rectory oven for our communion say thank you Helen the Lord is here his spirit is with us lift up your hearts we lift them to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord our God it is right to give them thanks and praise and so we pray together we praise and thank you loving Father through Jesus Christ our Lord as we obey your command, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and wine may be for us the body and blood of your precious Son. On the night you were betrayed, you took the bread. After giving thanks, you broke it and said, This is my body broken for you and as you eat it remember me this is my body broken for you and as you eat it remember me on the night you were betrayed you held the cup after giving thanks you lifted it up this is my to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. So my dear friends, receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ with faith and thanksgiving. Remember that he gave himself for you. Remember that he died for you and allow him to feed and nourish your body, mind and spirit. A reminder that everybody is welcome. If you're new here, if it's your first time, you're welcome to join in with communion. Children are welcome too to, to participate in communion. We have non-alcoholic and alcoholic wine here. Uh, non-alcoholic, I was going to say alcoholic for the kids, non-alcoholic for the grown-ups. But <laughs> if you'd rather have non-alcoholic, then, then uh, Rochelle, as she serves, just, just point to the one you want. That's fine. Um, if you'd rather not receive, then do, do come up to the front anyway. And it'd be my pleasure and privilege to ask for God to bless you. So just keep your hands by your side. If you want to receive, you just put your hands together like that with open palms upwards and then I can give you the bread. 
Brilliant. Thank you. Well done. Let's say thank you together with these words on the screen. Father God, we thank you for Jesus, our Saviour, our King and our best friend. Thank you for giving him to us and for feeding our hearts today. Amen. Now we've got a... Um, 
before the children go to their groups. We have actually got a really special song we're going to sing. It's called Rainbow Voices. This is written by Angie and with words by Angie and, and with a bit of help from me, inspired by Kaya here. And so it's just a really, really great song. I think it's going to become the anthem for St. Mark's. And it's a song that kind of has the verses, kind of tells a bit of the Christian story. And then the chorus is this wonderful chorus, this wonderful celebration of St. Mark's and who we are, the Christ, uh, Christ's church. So would you please stand? Let's sing Rainbow Voices together. Just great. So let's bless our children and young people as they go over to the hall now for their groups. Um, just before they go, Val has whispered in my ear that Aunt Ruth was 80 on Monday. I don't know if I see her age. Sorry, Ruth. Should we quickly sing happy birthday to Ruthie? There she is. Woo! Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Ruthie, happy birthday to you. Brilliant. So, so we've got our leaders are at the door, we've got Helen there and Jane and Sharini. So children, young people would like to head to your groups now.
Knowing Shireen, it probably involves chocolate. Is that right? Not today. Not today. Oh. Uh oh. I set her up there. Holy God, we thank you so much for the children and young people of this church. Lord, as they go to their groups, we pray that they have a wonderful, incredible time, a joyful time of play and learning. Lord, we thank you for our leaders that give up their time to prepare and to teach and to love our young ones. Lord, may they have the most awesome, wonderful time together, we pray. Amen. So we're going to remain seated for our Bible reading. The Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 22, verse 7 to 16. The day of unleavened bread came. This was the day the Passover lambs had to be sacrificed. Jesus said to Peter and John, go and prepare the Passover meal for us to eat. They asked, where do you want us to prepare it? Jesus said to them, listen, after you go into the city, you will see a man carrying a jar of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. Tell the person who owns that house, the teacher asks that you please show us the room where he and his followers may eat the Passover meal. Then he will show you a large room upstairs. This room is ready for you. Prepare the Passover meal there. So Peter and John left. Everything happened as Jesus had said. So they prepared the Passover meal. When time came, Jesus and the apostles were sitting at the table. He said to them, I wanted very much to eat this Passover meal with you before I die. I will never eat another Passover meal until it is given in its true meaning in the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you very, very much, Barbara. I'm just going to put that, that, that last bit of the Bible verse back on the screen, because this is kind of the key to what we're going to be talking about today, or we're going to be exploring today. And notice that last line. Let me just get this back up. Uh, you'll notice that last line there. I will never eat another Passover meal until it is given its true meaning in the kingdom of God. I wanted very much to eat this Passover meal with you before I die. I will never eat another Passover meal until it is given its true meaning in the kingdom of God. What's he talking about? The true meaning of what? The true meaning of the Passover meal. Until it's basically given its true meaning in the kingdom of God. The true meaning of the Passover meal is going to be revealed to you is basically what he is saying. And it's a strange thing to say, but of course all will become revealed. Now, we are on a journey together as a church. We are looking at a series, an eight-part series called Why Did Jesus Die? And last week was the first part in the series, and if you missed it, you can go back to St. Mark's website, go to Worship Messages. You can read or listen on there, or read the Royal Gazette from Saturday uh, in the religious section or the lifestyle section. And the first part we talked about was that the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus was to reconcile us to God. It was an act of reconciliation. Yeah, we had fallen away from God, we needed to be restored back to God. And that's perhaps the most, for me, it's perhaps the most important part of why did Jesus die, to reconcile us to God. Now it's important that we uh, look at these different ways of looking at the life, death and resurrection because they are all different perspectives that add up to a whole. We're going to cover eight different perspectives. And if you remember last week, if you were here, I described it like looking at a, a wooden cross in a courtyard surrounded by buildings. And if you look out from one window, you get to see one part of the cross. And if I go to the other side of the courtyard and look through another window, you get an, another kind of picture of the cross. But you need to look through all the windows to truly understand how great, how magnificent and wonderful the cross is of Jesus. So last week we looked at reconciliation and this week we're going to look at sacrifice. Now, sacrifice is a pretty grim word, isn't it? Probably a word we're not particularly comfortable using. It's not a word we use very much in everyday language. Sacrifice, this idea of sacrifice. And when we think of sacrifices, we think of altars and knives and animals being sacrificed. It's, it's not very comfortable. It's a, not a pleasant image for us, is it? Uh, to our modern sensibilities, this idea of sacrifice. And yet the New Testament 
writers speak of Jesus being a sacrifice all the way through. You'll find particularly in, in Paul's writings, Peter's writings, and particularly in the book of Hebrews, in the, in the New Testament, this idea of Jesus being a sacrifice. Now, we want to understand why, what, why is this important and what does it mean and why was Jesus referred to as being the sacrifice? Well, in the Old Testament, the Jewish temple priests offered animals on an altar as sacrifices to God. That's how they did it. The animals would be brought to the priests, slaughtered on the altar, and burnt as an offering. And the, the, the kind of smell and the, and the smoke would be, would be wafting up to heaven. And these would be burnt offerings. And there were all kinds of offerings, as you'll see. But some of them were to cleanse us themselves, the priests and the people, from their sin and make them holy. It's a kind of... Uh, it's a strange thing to get your head around, and we'll, we'll have a little metaphor in a moment that might help. But imagine there was the idea that we, the, the people recognized that they needed to be punished. They were unholy. And so what happened was the priest said, well, God has said it's okay. Rather than you being sacrificed or you being punished, bring us the best of your offerings. Bring us your, an, a, an unblemished lamb or a goat or doves or some of your, your crops, whatever it is you bring, and we'll sacrifice that to God. And it's a sacrifice to you because you're going to have to sacrifice your beloved pets, your, you know, your animals that you survive on. And I don't want any old ropey goats or, or sheep up here. It's got to be good ones, right? You've got to bring some really good ones up because it's going to hurt you more. And so, if you like, they were offered as a sin offering and the, the goats, the lambs, the unblemished, the perfect lambs and goats were sacrificed on your behalf. Now, I'm so glad that I am a priest in 2023 and not uh, 023, because if I was a priest 2,000 years ago, I'd be, you'd be bringing goats and lambs to me and I'd be having to take them up there and, you know, and that's just not my thing at all. Praise the Lord. But that's what it would have been, and you would have had to do this. And you would have had to do it over and over again, because as soon as you walked out of the temple, You'd go and sin again, right? You'd go and think things and do things and say things. You'd mess up and you'd need, your sins would need atoning for again. So the following month or week or whenever it was or year, you'd bring another goat and another lamb. We'd do it the whole, or a bull. We'd do the whole thing again. And over and over, year after year, month after month, to atone for your sins. And that was the system of the temple and the temple sacrifices that were taking place when Jesus was around. Jesus would have totally understood that this was what was going on. And so it's, if you like, it's no surprise then that the New Testament writers say, well, hang on, Jesus became the sacrifice once and for all, forever. Jesus is described in the New Testament as being both the priest and the sacrifice. Now, uh, to make everybody holy before God. Hebrews 7.27 says this, Unlike the other high priests, he, Jesus, does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He, that's Jesus, sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. But there's also echoes in the New Testament back to the Passover. Do you remember the Passover that we've got on the screen here that Jesus was celebrating? We've got links back to the Passover. Now, if you don't know what the Passover is, we need to go right back to the Old Testament, back to the book of Exodus. And in a very quick recap, the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians. You might remember the story. They were enslaved for many, many years. And God sent a series of plagues to the Egyptians as warnings, as signs to say, let my people go, let the Israelites go. But Pharaoh refused to let the Israelites go. And so finally, as the final act, God sends the angel of death to kill the firstborn son of every Egyptian household. It's a horrendous story, really, isn't it? But stick with it. The Israelites were spared because they had marked their doorposts with the blood of a sacrificial lamb. They took a lamb without blemish. They killed it. They uh, used the blood. They wiped it on their doorposts that night. And when the angel of death, as the story comes, came into Egypt... The firstborn Egyptian children died and the Israelites' children were survived. It literally passed over them. The angel of death passed, that's why it's called the Passover. The angel of death passed over them because of this blood from the sacrificial lamb. Now this is why the New Testament writers refer to Jesus 
as the Lamb of God. You might have heard that. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Now you know why. He's not just saying he's nice and cuddly and bleaty. <laughs> he's saying, no, no, no. He is the sacrificial Lamb. When John saw Jesus coming towards him, he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God. This unblemished Lamb. And as we know, Jesus had no, there was no sin, was there? He, he was without sin. Try and get your head around that. Um, anybody sin here? I mean, if, when Jesus stood trial before Pontius Pilate, before the governors and the Judean governors, when he stood, they couldn't pin a single thing on him, could they? They couldn't, they said, can anybody accuse this man of something? And they, they all just looked at each other like, well, and I remember, the, and they were thinking, oh yeah, I remember the time when Jesus, no, no, that wasn't Jesus, was it? No, that was somebody else. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. What about that time when Jesus did that really bad... No, no, that wasn't Jesus either, was it? No. They couldn't think of a single thing. If it was you or me standing trial, and they got every friend and every person we've ever met into a room and said, could you think of a single thing that Rev Gav has ever done wrong? (laughs) Or you, let's talk about you. (laughs) They'd be queuing up, wouldn't they? They'd say, well, hang on, how do you want them presented? In alphabetical order? We've got index cards and everything. (laughs) But for Jesus, not a single thing. He had done wrong. Nothing. He was this perfect, unblemished lamb, sacrificial lamb, if you will. If Jesus had sinned, think about this. If he'd sinned, if he'd done one thing wrong in his life, just one thing, he would have needed saving himself, wouldn't he? He would have needed saving. He he couldn't have saved anybody else. The very fact that he had done nothing wrong, the fact that he'd lived a perfect life, never, ever done anything wrong. Imagine that. He managed to do it. He managed to live every single day, struggling with temptation. Yes, he was tempted. People think he wasn't tempted. Of course he was tempted. But he didn't succumb. He didn't give in. And he did, and he managed to do that all the way to the end for us. So he become that sacrificial lamb for us once and for all. And what I like to think about is this, that when Jesus died on that cross, his, through his life, his death, and his resurrection, because as we know, death couldn't hold him because he hadn't done anything wrong, Because he had done this for us, it didn't mean just our past sins were forgiven. No, Jesus did it once and for all. Because when those people were going back with their animal sacrifices to the temple to to atone for their sins, they had to keep doing it over and over again, like we said, every month, every year. Jesus, though, and there's a problem with that. Obviously, sin wasn't really being dealt with, was it? If you had to keep going back and back and back. But Jesus dealt with it once and for all and forever for all humanity. Think about that. It wasn't just so that our past sins could be washed away. It means that every single thing you ever do in the future will be forgiven. It already has been dealt with. When you go out of this building and you go and do all the naughty things that you're going to go and do. (laughs) Don't go and do naughty things. I'm just kind of making a point. That they are forgiven. Jesus died for all your past sins, your present sins, and all the future sins for humanity for all time. It was done once and for all, one sacrifice, one atonement for sin, for everyone, forever. Forever. Those temple sacrifices, um, those temple sacrifices stopped in about 70 AD, thank goodness. But hopefully this deeper understanding, this Understanding the sacrifice, the sacrificial system will help us understand why Jesus is called the Lamb of God, why he's described as a sacrifice. One Peter says this, he says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. In other words, you weren't paid off. No, no one paid with silver or gold. No one used money to pay off your sins, your debts. He says, no. It was paid off with the precious blood of Christ. A lamb without blemish or defect. And those phrases are really important. Blemish or defect are the same phrases used in the Old Testament for the sacrificial lambs that were brought to the priests. Now, we, it's quite difficult to get our head around this idea of sacrifice, isn't it? But maybe one uh, metaphor is flowers, cut flowers. Think of them. Are they not a modern-day equivalent of a sacrifice? Have a think about it. What do we do? We go, we take... We literally sacrifice the flowers. We cut them, don't we? And then we present them to people. We present them, I might give them to you as a peace offering to say, I'm sorry. 
or to give you to say how wonderful you are, how much I love you. We have flowers at the front of our church here as a gift offering to God. Why are they there? Not just because they look pretty, but it's a way of saying, hey, we want to honour you, God. We want to, yeah, and it's a, it's a sacrifice. And actually, the New Testament writers say, well, if Jesus has been sacrificed once and for all, then therefore, what is our sacrifice now? Our sacrifice is twofold. It's a sacrifice of praise and a sacrifice of works. This morning, you are all coming to church. You could have laid in bed, watched the telly, Sorry, you've all got children, haven't you? You could have had to deal with your children or morning. You chose to come here. You chose to come here. This is your sacrifice of praise. You're giving of yourself. You're singing the songs. You're singing the, saying the words, the liturgy. This is, a, this is our sacrifice of praise to a God who sacrificed himself for us. Secondly, the New Testament writers say that we shouldn't just have a sacrifice of praise, but a sacrifice of works, to do the good works that God has prepared for us to do. Because whenever you do something good for somebody, you put yourself out, you're sacrificing yourself again. In the way you're sacrificing yourself this morning by coming here, you know, putting aside your time, your effort to be here. In the same way, when you do good works for others, you put yourself out for them. As Christians, that's, that's an act of praise, that's an act of worship when you do good things for other people. People back in biblical times brought of their own storehouse, and we today bring from our storehouses the praise and the good works that we're called to do. Now, at every church, you know, our churches are vaguely laid out on the Jewish temple format. Did you know that? So we have the nave of our church. This is called the nave, where the people gather. And then we have our chancel up here. They actually call this bit, the cross bit in a church, they actually call it a choir vestry. But actually, we call all this area our chancel. And right up here, we have our chancel. And this is built, the, the, the idea of it is built on the Holy of Holies. So the temple, you had the bit where the people were, and then you had the bit where the priests were. And did you know, it wasn't so long ago in Christian times that they got it a bit wrong, and only the priests were allowed to go in the Holy of Holies. And they put up barriers between they put up barriers between the people and the Holy of Holies. That's what they did. Personally, I, I think it's terrible because there should be no barriers between us and the Holy of Holies. Jesus tore down the temple. The temple was torn in two to show that there was no barrier. But, other, but what we have in, in here is we have a table that we call an altar. It's traditionally called an altar. But what is an altar for? It's a place of sacrifice. But it isn't anymore, is it? Jesus was sacrificed once and for all for the sins of all humanity forever. So therefore, when you hear me talking about our altar, you'll, you'll hear me calling it a table, because it's a table, it's a communion table, or our top table, or our high table, because I don't want to call it an altar, because it's not a place of sacrifice anymore. It might be a sacrifice of praise for us when we come to it, but, but it, I, it's not, it's a table. And you'll notice that in a lot of churches, the table um, used to be pushed back against the wall, and making it more of an altar, and we bring it out so that and I make sure I stand behind it when I celebrate because it's a table that we gather around to remember Jesus. And we share the bread and the wine as a remembrance of that last Passover, the last Passover where the last sacrificial lamb was sacrificed. Its true meaning in the kingdom of heaven was being revealed through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. This is love, says John. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Isn't that beautiful? If you think about it, this is not an act of a vengeful God who says, I'm going to sacrifice my son. Oh, you know, And it has echoes of that, doesn't it? But it's not that at all. Jesus was and is God. Jesus was giving of himself. If you love somebody perfectly, you give them everything, right? If you love somebody, perfectly love somebody, you give them everything. If I love you, I'm going to give you everything. I could give you all my possessions. Yeah, I love you. I'm going to give you all my possessions. I can give you all my money. Empty my bank account. There's not a lot in it. It's fine. <laughs> I can give you all my money. I can give you all my possessions. You can have my car, my laptop, my house keys, it's all yours. 
What is the very last thing I have to give you? Myself. The very last thing I have to give, the ultimate thing I have to give you is myself. Now think about what God did for us through Jesus Christ. He'd given us everything, everything we could ever want or need. The ultimate act of love, the ultimate gift that he could give was to give himself, to lay his life down that we might live. This ultimate sacrifice. So now when you understand why we speak about Jesus, Jesus, we're going to sing in a moment, Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. You became nothing, poured out to death. We're going to sing it in a moment. When we talk about the Lamb of God, when we talk about Jesus being a sacrifice, now you understand why, once and for all, for everyone. And the good news is that that cleansing, healing, forgiving and saving love of God is available to us today. All we need to do is to turn to him, our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you please stand? We're going to sing this beautiful hymn. We usually sing it with quite a boppy tune, but actually we're just going to sing it uh, acoustically today. So please stand. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. Father, thank you for offering your perfect Son as the ultimate sacrifice for all our sins, for all time. Thank you for sending your Son to welcome us with open arms, assuring us of your love. And so today, in Jesus' name, we come to you in prayer. Merciful God, we beseech you to provide relief to the survivors of the devastating earthquake in Morocco which has killed over 800 people. Please help emergency services to re rescue the people trapped in collapsed buildings and help them to swiftly provide aid in the remote areas. And Lord, please ease the suffering of the families who lost loved ones and end the aftershocks so that those too afraid to return home can do so with confidence. 
Lord God, please soften the hearts of leaders around the world who have chosen conflict over peace, so that with a change of heart and mind, they will choose reconciliation and an end to wars. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of creation, thank you for sparing us from the worst effects of Hurricane Adelia. Father God, we call on you again to protect us and all our southern and eastern neighbors from the potentially catastrophic effects of the Category 5 Hurricane Lee. Heavenly Father, as one, we ask for your intervention to reduce the strength of Hurricane Lee and nudge it onto a track that leaves all of us safe. Father of creation, we understand that it is the actions of humans that is causing global warming, leading to these larger hurricanes. We ask that you help decision makers attending the G20 summit in India to understand how climate change is harming our planet and help them to adopt more sustainable ways of living in our world. On a personal level, God, please help us to make those changes we can to live more in harmony with our world and instill in us the wisdom and commitment to be effective stewards of our earth. And Lord, please also guide the world leaders thinking as they ponder and seek solutions for food security and debt restructuring for poorer countries. Let any joint declarations be of your will adhere to and actioned. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we hold out our hands to you as we pray for guidance and support for our churches and our congregation. Help us to love and fellowship with each other and to take your message of sacrifice, love and forgiveness into the wider community. And dear God, as they endeavor to do your will, Please bless and guide Archdeacon Dowdy, Bishop Nick and Fiona, Canon John and Jane, Reverend Gav and Helen, Terry and Nicole, Canon N, Anne and family, the Wardens, Vestry, Sextons, Guilds and all teams of Holy Trinity Church and St. Mark's. Lord, in your mercy. Your no. Wise Counselor, we ask you to bless our island home Please engender our political leaders with knowledge and insight and help them to guide us with wisdom, compassion, and equality. Lord, in your mercy. God of healing, please continue to hold Nancy in your arms and heal her completely. Please strengthen and encourage her family as they provide her with support. Thank you for healing those in our community and other members of our church family. Please also hold in your hands and cure afflictions in all those who are injured or ill. In this moment of silence, we speak their names to you and ask that in the name of Jesus, they are healed. And Father, Comfort those of us who are grieving the loss of a loved one. Gently hold us in your loving arms. Build us up and ease our sorrow. Father, in this moment of silence, we speak the names of those in need of your consolation and compassion. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lamb of God, thank you for all of the children you have placed in our care each week. And as our new Sunday school year starts, we pray that you will give us the skills to educate and inspire our children so that they too grow to love and worship you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, keep us near the cross so that we remember the ultimate sacrifice that your son made for us. As the choir sings, may their words resonate with us and remind us of the perfect love of Jesus, who was born, lived an exemplary, sinless life, gave his life for us on the cross, then rose again and ascended to heaven to be our mediator until he comes again. And as we praise and worship together, honoring the life, death, 
and sacrifice of Jesus. May we welcome the Holy Spirit into us so that we can do his will. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very, very much, Val. Um, notices before we go. Uh, just the, the, the biggie is there's a really nice brunch in the church hall <laughs> taking place right after the service. So do come over to the hall for munchies. Um, if you are, if you've never taken one of these, you do these, these white cards, you'll see them in the Bibles in front of you. These are taking away. So if you want, to, if you can never remember what time worship is, pin this to your uh, fridge the fridge magnet or stick it on your notice board and, or, and, and also it might remind you to pray for St Mark's Church and our work here. Also, if you'd like to find out more information about St Mark's Church, you want to be added to, we've got a WhatsApp group that's very active and very lively, lots of chat and prayer going on there and we have our weekly emails that go out, our newsletter that goes out. Do fill in one of the yellow cards, you'll see pencils in the pews and just pop that in one of the boxes out there. It doesn't matter which box you pop it in. Uh, we've got a little housey box out there. Pop it in there uh, on your way out. Just to say, we don't take a collection during our worship. Uh, people mostly give online, but if you'd like to give, again, just pop some money in the box out there. And you'll see out there also a basket by the door as a retirement gift for Archdeacon Doughty. So we're going we're gonna to raise some money over the next couple of weeks. And as, as, uh, all the churches are going to give him a, a, a lump sum, I guess, in October. Uh, Archdeacon Doughty retires in November. So if you'd like to give to Archdeacon Doughty, there's a little basket out there too. Brilliant. Should we pray this dismissal prayer together? Dear Father, as we go from this place, may we be servants for Christ and people who bring your love. May we know your peace and serve you with all our hearts in the name of Christ. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you and all those that you love, now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn and then we're going. I promise, because I know it's been quite a long one this morning. Would you please stand? We're going to sing In Christ Alone.
Go in peace to love and to serve our Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. And I'll see you, see you over in the hall. I'm going to get there first. So I get all the bacon, all the sausages, all the pancakes, all the cheese, all the fruit. <laughs> see you over there. Have a great Sunday, everybody.